native plants. We've been using them for thousands of years to celebrate the National Science Week. Theme of food, different by design. We want to show you what we do with them. Well, here I am on beautiful Durrell country and I've come across one of my faves. In fact, two different types of native raspberries. Now I've pulsed up the native raspberries into almost a puree. Now I'll swirl that into my favourite muffin recipe. I'm on Darkinjung country and this is mint bush. It smells divine, but this is what I do with it. Mini mint bush pizzas. Something that's homegrown, but also adding that wow factor to any plate. Hi everyone, um, I'm glad I had my breakfast, otherwise I'd be really hungry after that great bush tucker video. Um, my name is Denise Sora and I am the Chief Executive of the Royal Botanic Gardens and Domain Trust and the Australian Institute of Botanical Science. And I'm really, really excited to be here today. Um, I'm here on Darrell Country in Grays Point, which is um, in the Southern Shire, and I'm really close to the beautiful Royal National Park. And I acknowledge that we're all meeting on so many different lands today, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and future, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people with us today. Um, in Australia, we have the world's oldest continuous culture and just should be very, very proud of that. So what a fantastic science week we've been having. Um, we've already seen thousands of students from across the country engage in the Sydney Science Trail um, programs uh, from women in STEM, um, environment conservation um, to food science. And today we're wrapping up an incredible week-long education program um, with this latest um, and unfortunately last event, but we're going to be recording everything so you can all watch them later. Um, this is my favourite scientist. You know, the Sydney Science Trail is a wonderful celebration of science presented in collaboration with the Royal Botanic Gardens and the wonderful Australian Museum and my um, wonderful friend um, Kim Mackay at the Australian Museum, who's CEO. Um, we're also very proud of the teams who work so hard to put this together so that, um, you know, we can get this out to so many wonderful students and communities. Um, so, you know, it's with my sincere thanks that we, we managed to pull this together. Um, it's also just such a great way to celebrate the diversity of careers in science. And, you know, what I love about it is it, it inspires the next generation of innovators. Um, every day I am so blessed um, to be surrounded by amazing scientists at the Australian Institute of Botanical Science. Um, and we're working on, you know, some of the most critical environmental challenges facing all life on Earth. Um, they're amazing individuals and, you know, each day I'm just totally blown away by the work that they do. So I love the opportunity and any opportunity to celebrate scientists. But more importantly, um, it's great for us to remember those that may not be remembered. And so our session today is, um, you know, an opportunity to do that. Um, and let me just sort of give you an example for, um, you know, if you can imagine the, um, the six courses across Year 11 and 12 New South Wales curriculum, there are only two female scientists compared to 80 male um, scientists that are actually referenced. And before the 20th century, women weren't really able to access science unless it was through collaboration with, um, you know, male family members, and particularly if they were very, very wealthy. Um, and, you know, often they were very much, well, in fact, they were very often excluded. And an interesting example that I like to refer to 
is um, Hendarina Scott. Now, Hendarina actually pioneered the time-lapse photography while she was working on um, some work with her husband, some botanical work. And, um, you know, we have to think about how do we remember those individuals who have actually done some incredible work, but they're just not referenced. And so we've got to make changes to that. So anyway, enough. I can go on forever about that particular topic. Um, but today is about my favourite scientist. And we have such an incredible panel for you. I hope you have a wonderful time. I'm really looking forward to listening. And I'm going to hand over to the extraordinary Hervé, who's going to introduce our expert panel for you today. Take care and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much, Denise, and welcome everyone. We're so excited to have this event today. Uh, and without further ado, I will uh, introduce uh, our panel and um, quickly then I will explain how the event will run. So perhaps uh, our three panelists, would you mind putting your, your videos on? So you're gonna come very soon. Thank you. All right, so uh, my name is Abe Soke. I work here at the Royal Botanic Garden Sydney. And um, this event is not about myself. Uh, I'm just gonna be the moderator for today. So our first panelist uh, will be Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith, who's an astrophysicist and uh, also the current uh, Australian government women in STEM ambassador. So welcome, Lisa. Our next speaker will be uh, Chris Matthews, who is a professor uh, at the University of Technology, Sydney, and uh, also the Associate Dean of, uh, in the Science Faculty uh, for the Indigenous uh, Leadership and Engagement. And uh, Chris is a mathematician, uh, from what I understand. And our last uh, speaker will be Christopher Helgen, uh, who is uh, the Chief Scientist and Director of the Australian Museum Research Institute, and who is a biologist uh, specializing on mammals. So welcome, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you so much for giving uh, uh, part of your time for today's uh, very special event. And welcome, especially everyone in the audience. We're really excited to have you here. I understand you're uh, more than 500 uh, registered participants from uh, classrooms all over uh, New South Wales but we also have a growing number of people watching us live. So that's, that's really exciting. Um, today we'll uh, start with a brief introduction of uh, each speaker's favorite scientist. Uh, by the way, I, sh I should let you know, we don't know who they are yet. So we have agreed among our panel to not tell each other who they are. Um, so we can have a little bit of a surprise reaction. So I, I have we're taking a risk here. I have no idea uh, who Lisa, Chris and Christopher have come, come with. Uh, but importantly, this event is all about uh, underrepresented scientists, uh, people who are doing really important work, uh, but that you may not have never have heard about through a textbook or media appearances. And in fact, as uh, I hope will be uh, become obvious through this panel, uh, science is the work of thousands, actually millions of people uh, in the past, but also currently at present. And it is actually impossible to narrow down important work to just one person. Maybe we did that in the 18th century, but we no longer do that. Um, but anyway, today we'll be about highlighting some of those individuals in particular, and each person will come with their uh, specific reason. We'll also be taking questions. I believe uh, registered participants have the opportunity of sending questions through our SurveyMonkey link. So please do, uh, we'll be able to ask your questions to the panelists uh, after a, a brief introduction. So thank you so much again. And Lisa, perhaps in a, in a few minutes, can you tell us who is your favorite scientist? Yeah, sure. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to join you in National Science Week. Um, it's a shame I can't see all your wonderful faces, but I'm imagining you. So um, I'm an astrophysicist, and that's a really long word that means someone who looks at space for a living. So my job is to look into outer space using big telescopes um, and study what the stars are doing, what the galaxies are doing, uh, and how the universe works. So it's a pretty cool job. Um, I've studied in my time exploding stars, black holes, gravitational waves, like wibble wobbles of space and time. It's absolutely brilliant. So I picked my favorite scientist, um, a very unsung hero, I would say, 
um, from my own particular background. And that is Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell. I hope no one else has picked her. Um, she's an astrophysicist. She's now, I think, more than 80 years old, but she made an incredible discovery in the 1960s, way back when. So Jocelyn Bell was um, a graduate student. And what that means, she'd done her degree in astronomy. So she'd been to university, studied her degree, and then she was studying another degree that we call a PhD. Now that's a, a doctorate degree. So it makes, means you can be called doctor at the end of, of it, but it doesn't mean you're a medical doctor. It means you're a, a scientist who's learned their trade. So she was working at, uh, she came from Northern Ireland, but she was working at the University of Cambridge in Southern England. And she spent a couple of years in her PhD degree, her doctorate degree, studying um, essentially the radio waves from the sky. Now that sounds a bit strange. Why would radio waves come from the sky? Well, they don't magically appear. They actually appear in outer space and they travel to the earth um, through millions or even billions of light years. And they travel to the earth. Uh, in fact, they're traveling in all directions, but the earth happens to get in the way of some of them. And then she was building a radio telescope, so a device that could actually pick up those waves and understand what they were telling us about space. So the, this hadn't been done for very long, it was only invented in the 1940s and 1950s. So in the 1960s, she was building this telescope. Basically she had um, to get about 2000 wooden poles um, and place them in a field in Cambridge with her other graduate student friends. Um, and then they strung pieces of wire across these poles, across many kilometers. I've actually been to this place, it was, it's really cool. Uh, and the telescope is still there. Now you might think of telescopes being looked through, but in fact, this radio telescope was just poles and wires, um, a bit like an antenna uh, that you would pick up TV signals with uh, or radio signals. So she was building this amazing telescope. She was looking up into space and seeing what she could figure out about the sky. And uh, she and her academic supervisor, that was basically her boss, working together. But one night she discovered something incredible in the radio signals that were coming down from space. And it was this really odd signal. And it was going beep, 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 beep. It was actually like a repeated pulse of radio waves. And no one had ever heard anything like this. All the other radio waves were like crackles from space. And they were they were pointing to galaxies where black holes were ripping up stars and um, hot gas was screaming out in radio waves and showing us where these black holes were in the sky. But this beep, 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 this regular pulsed star signal was the first that had ever been discovered. And then they discovered more and more and more. And Jocelyn Bell was at the center of this incredible discovery. So we now know there are just millions of these pulsing stars throughout the universe. They're actually the remnants of a star that has died at the end of its life, has exploded and left behind a really tiny, dense core at the middle of the star that's about six to 10 kilometers across, so about the size of uh, inner Sydney. So this star is spinning so very, very fast, faster than your washing machine spin cycle, way, way faster than that, in fact. And it's going sometimes at a thousand times a second, spinning round and round and round and emitting a pulse like a lighthouse beam of radio waves. Now you might think, so what? Okay, it's a cool star, it sounds interesting, but in fact, these pulsars, these radio stars can help to teach us about how Einstein taught us to understand the very, very nature of gravity, what gravity is, what its secrets hold, and therefore what the history and also the future of our universe might be. So this was an incredible discovery because pulsars are an amazing tool. They teach us about gravity uh, and they teach us also about gravitational waves and how space and time are very wibbly wobbly. So Dame Jocelyn Burnell at the time got almost no credit for this discovery. In fact, her supervisor, got awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery that she had made. Um, and this is a real injustice that a lot of people have been slightly miffed about for quite a while. In fact, it was only really righted this wrong about uh, a few years ago, about five years or more ago, when she was awarded the Breakthrough Prize 
which is a $3 million prize from uh, a group from the US who gave her this money as a recognition that she really should have won the Nobel Prize. And you know what she did with that money? She gave every single cent straight to a charity that helps underrepresented groups of people and young people get into science. So what a hero Jocelyn Bell really is. Oh, thank you so much, Lisa. That's a really impressive story. And um, you're setting up the bar really high. So <laughs> it will be hard to follow on this. But um, thank you so much for sharing. And I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about uh, Jocelyn Bell Bernal again through uh, this conversation. So Chris Matthews, off to you. Who is your favorite scientist? Well, I'll have to admit that when I was um, um, growing up, I never had a role model. Uh, to 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 sort of um, look up to, um, and I'm not quite sure the other panelists were in the same boat, but I, I did not didn't know if there were other Aboriginal people part of STEM. So a little bit of way of introduction. I'm I'm actually want to acknowledge the fact I'm on Kwandamuka country. This is my country, uh, Kwandamuka people um, of Minjuriba. Um, that's uh, Stradbroke Island in, in the Morton Bay near Brisbane. Um, I'm sitting here on Nandibi, which is part of our country, which is referred to as Cleveland. Um, and what I did in my life was I actually um, uh, became a mathematician. Um, and from, you know, from entering into science, I, I never really sort of had anybody to look up to. Um, I had to um, endure. I, did, I didn't grow up in my community. I didn't grow up here where I'm sitting now. I grew up in a place called Toowoomba, um, west of Brisbane. And through my education, uh, you know, you have to deal with, with a lot of uh, racism from students as well as teachers so what I, what I had to do was learn to sort of hide within education um, and what helped me hide within education was my you know I was obsessed with science fiction with Star Trek with all those sorts of shows uh, in search of everybody remembers that you know those, that's a more of a science show um, um, and you know if you want to think of a role models in some crazy way you know Spock was my role model um, <laughs> um, but um, uh, so to deal with that racism, really, I buried myself into learning about computers because I grew up in, I was going to school in that, those uh, uh, early 80s, finished in the, in the late, late 80s schooling, but that early, that 80s period was a time when computers started to become uh, household, you know, uh, things in the household. So I, grew, I, I was obsessed with learning how to program and also come across the sort of uh, connection between programming and uh, mathematics which then becomes a you become a ma mathematical modeler where you would try and model real systems on a computer effectively um, um, so there's all as, as part of all that I was hiding within that world um, it, it, it wasn't until I was sort of doing my PhD in in, in, uh, in applied mathematics that someone you know pointed to this fellow named um, David Unipen and that sort of changed changed my world knowing about him. Um, David Unipin is from the Nanangiri people. Um, that's, that's a people of the, at, near the Coorong at the bottom of the Murray in uh, South, South Australia. He's from the Nanangiri. And he um, grew up in the, in the, he was born about 1870s and he passed away about 1960s. So he grew up in that period where Australia was very young. Um, and he also grew up in a period where Aboriginal people were um, not part of the constitution. Um, so we weren't allowed to vote and we didn't have any, any rights. Um, so he didn't have an education, but he educated himself within science. He was lucky he worked for a, a person because a lot of Aboriginal people in education were trained to be servants. So he, he, was, he was working for a, a man who allowed him to read his library. And, he, and through that connection, he was reading a lot of scientific journals. Before there were universities in Australia, he was reading his scientific journals and was, you know, just taking it all on. Um, um, and what he also did is he also was started to write about Aboriginal culture. And through those writings, if you read some of his early writings, he was marvelling at the, at the scientific nature and the mathematical nature of Aboriginal people's not, not knowledges as well within that writing. Um, so he was doing two things. He was writing about his own people, trying to get more understanding around that, um, but also obsessed with, with the science. Um, 
So what he's more sort of well known for is, well, there's actually two things he's well known for. He, um, he wrote down how you could invent the helicopter from the aerodynamics department um, before there was any prototype of the helicopter as we know it. Um, and he also, um, um, they, and if you read about him, they, they say that he um, uh, improved the handpiece for the shears. Yeah. So in the early part of Australia, the main industry was wool and a lot of Australia's economic development was um, off the sheep back, really. It was about wool. You know, economic development in Australia was about wool. Um, and there was an Englishman who invented a, um, the mechanical shears, but they couldn't reconcile how to get that rotation motion of the, of the machine through to where you cut the blade. So what he did is he actually invented the hinge that allowed that circular motion to be in, a, in that planar motion. So those clippers you get your hair cut with, that's from his invention, yeah? So that invention helped more sheep to be sheared and, and increase the economic development of Australia. So what I'd like to say about him is he actually revolutionised the shearing industry. He, revolu he was part of the economic story of Australia but he is not well known within our history. And I just before coming on um, here, I was Googling shearing history and, and there's a lot of organisations, I won't name them, who have stuff about shearing history, but he's not named in there at all. You know, so what I'm trying to say here today too is that as, as Aboriginal people and also Aboriginal kids now, we don't get access to these role models because we, we silence them within our history. So I might leave it there. Is that all right, Ava? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. This is a very powerful and fascinating story. And although we can not um, solve all the problems today, we can at least do justice to uh, three people. So I think um, David should be really thankful that you're here today to uh, bring him back to the light. Um, so thank you so much. And um, Christopher, off to you. Thanks, Hervé. And thank you, Lisa and Chris. Those are uh, just spectacular examples. And thank you to everyone for joining us today for the uh, for Sydney Science Trail. Um, favorite scientists. Uh, I'm a scientist. My profession is as a mammologist. So I study wild mammals, um, and I've studied them all around the world as part of my career. I have a passion for wildlife, for natural areas. I grew up in Minnesota, in the United States, up north near Canada and uh, became absolutely um, just fascinated with, with wildlife from my earliest days. And I think like a lot of kids do, we find some fascination early on that uh, um, grabs a hold of us and makes us interested, something that uh, allows us to, to kind of find our way towards an interest in science or nature or mathematics. So for me, it was, it was animals and, and nature, natural history. And as I uh, studied and uh, you know, went to university and uh, I started to realize that maybe unexpectedly, one of the most important places in the world that you can learn about the great diversity of life um, is actually in natural history museums. So I'm now the chief scientist at the Australian Museum, and that's been a part of a path that's taken me towards you know, understanding that when we want to, as scientists, solve these really intricate puzzles and problems, questions like, how many kinds of animals or plants are there on the planet? What are their distributions? Which ones are rare or common? What do they do for a living? How do they sum up into the ecosystems that make our world uh, pick? Um, it's behind the scenes in big collections that are stored in cabinets and storerooms, which are the raw material that we use as scientists for answering these questions. So those kind of questions are always on my mind and we build as science scientists in this kind of work, as in any other, always on the work of those that have come before us, scientists that have come before us. And as we've heard today from the other speakers and from Hervé at the introduction, you know, uh, science is an effort that takes, you know, uh, takes uh, commitment and contribution from a huge number of people. And most people in science are actually unsung heroes. Most people who have ever made these scientific contributions. My favorite scientist that I want to emphasize today is a woman named Evelyn Cheeseman. And she is really my favorite scientist. It's C-H-E-E-S-M-A-N, Evelyn Cheeseman. And Evelyn Cheeseman 
was a British woman who was born in 1882. And she was like me. She had this fascination with animals and nature from the earliest age. Uh, and she was um, just absolutely grabbed the hold of, this grabbed the hold of her. Now, uh, one of the ways that she wanted to pursue that, she was very interested, very brilliant young woman, uh, and she wanted to become a veterinary surgeon. But uh, the Royal College of the Royal Veterinary College in London at the time wasn't admitting women to those programs. She had to find other ways to pursue her interests. She uh, ultimately ended up uh, working is so brilliant as the first uh, female curator at the London Zoo. But her special fascination amongst animals was actually insects, some of the smallest uh, species, terrestrial species. And she became fascinated with things like butterflies and moths and beetles. And she had a chance in the early 1920s to join an expedition going from the London Zoo out to the South Pacific, places like Tahiti, et cetera. And uh, she got so hooked on doing these expeditions and going out and working with people who lived in rainforest environments in different parts of the Pacific and who knew their local environments incredibly well, that she thought, this is my passion, this is what I wanna do. She actually left that zoo expedition because she thought it was so badly organized. And then from the next 30 years, from the 20s to the 1950s, she became kind of well known for being a solo expeditioner. As a single woman by herself, she went for years at a time through all the archipelagos of the Pacific, especially places like Papua New Guinea, West Papua, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, um, places that were really, really hard for anyone to work in. And she went there by herself. She was not wealthy. She didn't have uh, independent means. How did she uh, support herself? Well, she, in between expeditions um, where she was collecting samples of the natural world, especially insects, um, she would bring them back to the British Museum of Natural History, the Natural History Museum in London, and they would go into the collections there and she would study and work on them there. Um, and if she had been a man, she probably would have been given a research scientist position at that museum. But instead, for decades, she was given a role at that museum that was essentially equivalent, but unpaid. So she ended up writing books. She wrote books and many, many books. She wrote dozens of books about her expeditions and her travels, and they are rich with scientific insight and reference. Some of them became quite popular, and they were printed as sort of those penguin paperback editions you might buy in the 40s or 50s, maybe at a train station in London. Um, but we don't know about her because um, her name didn't rise sort of to the top of the kind of pioneering hero expeditioners that we think of as associated with, with museums during this era, even though her numbers tally up, she discovered so many species of plants and insects, about 70,000 specimens that she collected ended up, especially in the museum in London, but also in some museums here in Australia. Um, I could go on and I maybe will when we ask more questions, but uh, we tend not to remember the name of someone like Evelyn Cheeseman, but she was a true hero of natural history exploration. And one thing she's well known for in her books captures so well is that she was one of the few that was approaching with deep respect the indigenous communities in all of these places and realizing that learning about the natural history of all of these incredible rainforest island environments that she was visiting first had to be approached by asking people what they knew about their own country and learning from them about what the nature of the place was like. So a tremendous, tremendous person. Imagine that pioneering sojourning spirit that was required uh, when so many doors were, were closed from uh, all of her trek through science until um, she uh, finished her life in the 1960s. So read her books, remember her. And today as a museum scientist, we're still still using that raw material that she collected to describe new species. Oh, I want to say one more thing, Hervé, before I go, and that is that Evelyn Cheeseman, we think of Evelyn as a woman's name now, but it was it, for a long time, it was a British male name. And so there are many, many people even today when they see Evelyn Cheeseman on a book or they see her name on a museum specimen tag or in an exhibition, they still oftentimes as a knee jerk response think that this was a man. But Evelyn Cheeseman was, uh, was a woman. Thank you so much, Christopher, uh, for sharing this incredible uh, story. 
Um, so thank you all. We now have um, heard your three nominated favorite scientists. And I suppose uh, we're probably gonna talk about them again throughout the conversation. We have uh, about another half hour to discuss. Um, if you're listening to us today, uh, please don't hesitate to ask any questions because we'll make sure to ask these to our panelists. Uh, but in the meantime, I, I did want to ask a question to all of you, um, Lisa, Chris, and Christopher. You have highlighted some uh, problems uh, from historical figures or people who worked in the past about uh, being less recognized for various reasons, either because they were uh, First Nations or a person um, who was a woman. Now, do you think these problems are still ongoing or has the world gotten a little better uh, today? Do you see these problems still happening in today's science? Maybe I, if I start? Sure. I'd, I'd say the answer to your question is, is both. Um, things have got better since like the 1800s, definitely. Um, discrimination is less, um, uh, overt, I suppose. So the word meaning, you know, in in those days, women were actively um, completely cut off from being able to be scientists, and and that was, you know, very overt, very obvious. But um, you know, now the problems still remain um, that many people are still underrepresented in science and technology. So although you'll see a lot of women training to be scientists and being amazing scientists, there is still a gap between the recognition of different people in, in science or STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. So, I mean, that's my job. My job is to try to increase the participation of women and girls in STEM and other um, underrepresented groups as well. And it's not just underrepresented, but um, historically um, excluded groups. Um, so although things are getting better, the problems are still there. And I'll give you an example. I talked about Jocelyn Bell earlier and her dis great discovery of pulsars, these spinning stars, um, that was credited to her supervisor and he won the awards for it. Um, I'm actually currently talking to uh, a, a woman scientist in Australia right now in 2021, who this is happening to. Again, she made a great discovery. She published it in a journal and all the newspaper pieces were about her male supervisor. So it's still happening today, sadly. We still have to work really hard to shine a light on these things and to be honest and open that these problems still remain. Um, but obviously the you know, exclusion, the extreme exclusion of, of women uh, from science has ended, but we still have to be very, very careful to make sure that science is accessible to everyone and that everyone is recognized and rewarded for their uh, contributions. As science is no longer, um, as you said earlier, the, the domain of, of like a lone genius, that idea that a scientist is someone who works alone. People work now in in groups of hundreds of hundreds of scientists around the world. Um, and often when we write a scientific paper, we write our results. There are hundreds of scientists um, who contribute to that, um, to that uh, article. So, you know, that's, that's a great thing that science is changing, um, but we do have to be careful that we don't get complacent. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. This is really interesting. I, I do have a follow-up question, actually, on your example of a modern female scientist whose uh, work has been um, featured in the media, but under with, with someone else is being featured. I see that happen a lot in press releases. And um, I think in, sometimes like everyone is responsible, right? Um, except perhaps the person being uh, underrepresented. But do you think, do you think this is in maybe not necessarily in this particular example, but in other examples you have seen, is this the problem with the supervisor who hasn't um, retracted enough from the work uh, that they have supervised to make sure the highlight goes to the actual first author? Or is it a problem with the media who are uh, biased towards picking up male names in their uh, coverage? I actually find that um, the media are very 
careful now when I when people talk to me um, they, they really do want um, a representative scientist someone who uh, represents the the kind of people working in the field who represent uh, modern Australia and um, you know I know people like the ABC have worked really hard to get uh, more women represented on the screens and um, and probably more cultural diversity as well as used to be seen but you know a lot of commercial networks are not doing this work um, which is disappointing but in terms of um, responsibility we all have a responsibility so if you're um, if you work at a university and you're putting out a press release so this is telling the media hey we've made a great discovery we need to make sure that we're crediting the right people for the discovery and the person who wrote the paper as well as the supervisor. And it may be that lots of people take credit, um, but it's always important in life, I think, to recognize credit where it's due. So, um, you know, when people win the Olympics, they thank their coach and they thank their parents and people who have sacrificed for them to make that um, success happen. So I think it's the same in science. We need to really recognize the people behind the scenes who help um, discoveries like the people who wrote the software uh, the mathematicians the support staff the people who built the telescopes or the you know the instruments that you use as a scientist i think that's really important too thank you so much uh chris or christopher do you have any do you want to answer the question as well yeah look i, I agree at least in the sense that um things are moving forward you know um and we still have a long way to go i believe um, but particularly with Aboriginal people within this country, because um, what the what we as Aboriginal science, because we, we actually are starting to develop a STEM professional network um, that was uh, the the brainchild of Bradley Mugridge, um, who is also an Aboriginal scientist in in water, um, and also through the support of STA um, Science Technology Australia and the K Academy of Sciences, and also the uh, K K Academy of uh, Technology and Engineering. Um, so all those three organisations are, are sort of supporting us in developing the STEM professional network. So there is a lot of movement in that regard. Um, and we, we, we did bring together about 60 um, STEM professionals, Aboriginal STEM professionals, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander STEM professionals, I should say. Um, and, and what came out of that meeting was that people still feel uh, isolated within their discipline. They, they don't feel like they can be who they are when they're actually being the scientist, you know. Um, and also what we are trying to do, a lot of us try to do as well, is to look at how our careers can benefit our communities and also looking at knowledge-based relationships, what are, what are scientific knowledge and Aboriginal knowledge systems and how they can relate to each other. Um, and in, in respect, David Unipin's life was about that. He was really, he valued Aboriginal people culture and, and stuff. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say that, Aboriginal people's knowledges. And he looked at scientific knowledge. And for me, even those inventions of the helicopter and even, even the, um, the hinge had an aspect of, of respecting both worlds. And those things were born from that. He had, he had many, many patents. Um, and because he didn't have any economic base, he had, he, he had what he had, he had provisional patents. And that way I understand patent law is that once a provisional patent expires, anybody can take that and use that for themselves. Um, so his family to this day, or you know, he himself obviously he passed away, but his family has never ever had any economic benefit from his inventions. Um, so I was really pleased to hear Lisa's story that 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 that, um, uh, that her role model actually got those millions of dollars. But then I start to think, you know, you still have a whole family there that never got anything for for his inventions and what he did. Um, and also, just one, can I add another person in to my little story? Is that okay? Of course. Because um, um, I also did in 2017 what they call the um, the uh, Jack Stephen Kuzak Moral Lecture at CSIRO. And I'd never even heard of this man before, but he was a Walpri man. And when I, took, when I looked at the bio again on the, on the CSIRO web, web, website, he... Um, they do a little bit of a bio on him where he was um, taken from his family and raised in Tiwi Islands there. Um, but what he what he did do was he was a long-serving um, Aboriginal staff member of the CSO Raven Darwin's office. Um, but his role there was a tech technical officer. But what was also recognised is that he was an expert botanist, is the way they described him. He also trained 
many or several generations of scientists through through that department. Um, and he also did intense research with academics on his own country as well. Um, but I suppose from when I read his story, he was still stuck as a technical officer, even though they recognised his knowledge and there was a lot of benefit from his knowledge and there was a lot of papers benefit, that had benefit from that and started to benefit from it, that recognition to me wasn't sort of, you know, wasn't right there, you know. Um, and, and even if you look at the bio, it's quite short and you think to yourself, well, you know, they really should have a section of the impact. You know, what are the publications that come out of working with him and looking at this knowledge-based relationship, you know, because he was bringing Aboriginal knowledge system in connection with science and obviously there was something worthwhile coming out of that relationship. Thank you so much. I, I have a, a, a quick question about one of the topics that you raised earlier is the, the importance of um, groundwork and um, communicating once you're, you're a scientist from uh, a less represented minority. Do you feel uh, in that position in your current role that a lot of pressure is put on very few individuals uh, who have been um, strong enough to make it to that stage? Or do you think it's distributed enough in a way that you're not being asked all the time to, uh, to talk about the topic? Um, sorry, you asked me, sorry. Yeah. Um, oh, media. Um, there's obviously a section of media that's really supportive of what we're trying to achieve, I think, as Aboriginal scientists. Um, and even when you see the, um, there's been a quite a, a, a uh, there's a strong cohort of uh, young female astrophysicists at the moment, like Carly Noon, as, as one example, um, um, that has been quite heavily within the media. Um, uh, what I'll say about media, and I've been in the media a few times myself, but I'm not as, a, um, I think astrophysics catches the imagination more than mathematics sometimes. <laughs> um, the, um, the thing for me, though, is that there's another part of the media that wants to position us as, um, well, actually, uh, recently I was, I, was, I was dubbed a race radical. Um, so the race radical is that you are, um, you know, when you start to privilege Aboriginal knowledge systems uh, within something like science, some reaction usually is that um, you're trying to... Uh, undermine science or you're trying to you're trying to create something less of yeah and and i work heavily within education now i've actually moved away from applied mathematics and work very heavily within education and even that sort of the that sort of uh, reaction happens where if you're trying to introduce Aboriginal perspectives in the curriculum it's like a dumbing down of the curriculum um, um and and the and this reaction i think is interesting and, and needs to be noted and it also brings up out negative media for Aboriginal people in this space as well. Um, as happened to the astrophysics um, cohort, I know, um, happened to myself, where they're actually trying to say that what we're doing are fantasizing, romanticizing, this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so I think there's a long way to go with media. There is support out there, but we still have that negative aspect that really impacts our personal lives as well. Thank you so much. Christopher, did you want to answer that question as well? Sure, I'd like to say a few things. So, um, you know, yeah, all of us highlighted uh, scientists that uh, are, you know, in the historical figures. And, uh, you know, we, as we, there, we identified some of the problems that kept them from being recognized as they should have. And the question as to whether this still happens today, I, I agree that, you know, things have gotten better, but... I think this is remains a huge problem in science today. And so um, some of the things that, you know, if you're a student and you're dreaming about becoming a scientist and you're fascinated and you have a passion for maybe studying a particular subject, you know, working out puzzles, learning something more about the world, these kinds of noble aspects of being a scientist, these are the best parts of being a scientist. And, you know, these are when you're when you're a kid and you think about science in that way, these are great things to aspire to. So you might imagine that ideally then science works as sort of a community of scholars or thinkers working towards, you know, really fundamental problems and coming up with solutions. And in some ways it does. But, you know, Lisa mentioned the Olympics, which we've all just 
uh, watched. And what I've found, and I think others find, is when they enter science professionally, it looks a lot more like the Olympics than a community of scholars working towards sol solving difficult problems together. And what I mean is, um, you know, in the Olympics, there are lots of people that are incredible athletes, but some of them, you know, some of them may find their way to better training from an earlier start, you know, better technology. They may have a bike or a horse or a swimming pool, whereas others may not. And those kind of sports, you know, mean that if you get an early exposure, lots of training, lots of education, lots of hard work, lots of coaching, um, you can move pretty fast up into that system. And eventually, eventually enough get, uh, resource gets poured into you that the very, very, very few gold and silver and bronze medals out there, you know, they're within your grasp. And science is a bit like that. You know, um, the gold medals we end up working towards are things like, you know, really prominent papers that get a lot of media attention or um, the fact that there's a huge amount of government funding worldwide for science, but that a very small number of people usually end up getting it. So what I'm getting at is um, there's really limited resources. It's a really competitive situation. And sometimes we've got our eyes more in science on the shiny metals than answering the questions that we got into in the first, you know, got into this in the first place. So I think because of that high level of competition, it means that, you know, not everybody wants to be in, in the mix for a gold medal, right? Some people want to make other kinds of contributions and they fall off along the way. Science may end up rewarding things like putting everything you have into training to being the best, that, you know, that, that is gonna be out there that can grab the gold medal. That might mean setting aside other goals. It might have set aside financial goals. It mean, might mean setting aside family goals. And I think what we need to do is uh, recognize all of those different kinds of priorities and challenges and make sure that the right kind of training gets to everyone who wants it early on and that the right kind of motivations and priorities and, and rewards uh, find their way through the system of, of doing science in a way that's different from it as well. That's wonderful um, thoughts, Christopher. And I, I did. We're, we're mentioning quite a few issues, um, but I hope within the last twenty minutes we have, we can also uh, find solutions. And I, I did want to ask all of you uh, about something that's uh, becoming more and more important on my mind. Is we as we all started science, we. I'll speak for myself. I had no idea what I was getting into um, for so many reasons. In fact, actually, when I was a kid, when I was uh, 10 years old, I wanted to be um, either an astrophysicist or a paleontologist. None of that happened. Later on, actually, I wanted to do ocean marine biology. That it didn't happen either. Um, but there's a lot of surprises in science as we move along the way. We discover things that suddenly become extremely interesting that we had absolutely no idea existed. Uh, for me, that would be the case of plants uh, and evolution in general. And so, but a lot of us have navigated this um, uh, field throughout our career um, by ourselves, uh, by, by a lot of U-turns and episodes of chance and and uh, some of us are lucky to still be alive and being paid for being a scientist, and we love it. We, I mean, I'll speak for myself again. I, I, every day I'm so happy that I have this job. It's one of the best jobs in the world. Uh, if any of you in the audience ever thinks about it, we'll, we'll try and give you a few reasons towards the end of this panel why you should be a scientist. There's so many reasons. Um, but do, do you guys think that we should actually take more advice uh, throughout the way and ask more scientists how it is to be a scientist, what it means. Because sometimes we're just uh, restricted by the people we get to talk to or our, our teachers, sometimes who are amazing people of inspiration and other, other ones are frankly bad teachers. Um, no offense for any teachers in the audience today, but you know, it, there's different talents there. And so we don't always get inspired by the people we have access to. Do you think that mentoring uh, should be an important development for uh, improving uh, the diversity of people represented in science. Would that help or is that uh, a naive idea? Well, I, I, I sort of, 
I just sort of remember when I was young thinking I wanted to be an astrophysicist after I'd looked at the stars with my dad and I thought it was really, really cool. I just read loads of books. I watched TV shows. Like I got information from wherever I could, but it was only really the media because, you know, I lived in a small community, like in rural region of England. I, I, I didn't have access to any scientists. I didn't have access to anyone who'd even been to university. So I didn't, you know, I didn't know what that world looked like. So, you know, when I... When I joined my local astronomy society, it was like a group of local people who were really interested in looking at the stars. They had telescopes and stuff. You know, they weren't professional scientists, but I found like a new level of interest. But then when I first met a professional astronomer, you know, I actually asked them, what, what, do, you, what do you have to do to, to be a scientist? And, and they were telling me that and this is what I found out as a scientist, there are so many different career paths. There are so many different ways you can be uh, a scientist. Um, and I found even in my career, you know, I've made different decisions at different times and it could have taken me one way uh, or another. And as an example, um, you know, in, in my career, I've worked in universities and that's very different from working in the CSIRO, which is a research organization which doesn't teach students. Um, you, do, you, do, you do help train students, but it's not the point of the CSIRO is not to, to teach students as a university is. So it's very different and you have different um, experiences. Uh, and then throughout my career, I started to um, do more things with the media and talking about the projects I was doing. Um, and I became uh, a TV presenter and I never expected to do that as a scientist. And I started writing books um, about science and I never expected to do that because I never really liked writing as a child. So, you know, my career has taken me in so many different places. And at each point, um, you may or may not have a mentor, but you always have an inspiration. So if you can see something that you enjoy, if you want to be um, an artist and you can, you can look on the internet, look at art, you can, you know, take part in that world in some way, whether it's through YouTube, through communities online, through, you know, in-person stuff, but we can always see something uh, and try and move towards that goal. And that's, that's I think, very important um, because not everyone can access mentors and that's, that's quite a privileged position for people. Um, maybe people in big cities, maybe who go to a good school um, can access that, but not everyone can. Um, so it's always important to, to ask advice, move towards things that you enjoy and, and try and just absorb information. And that's what life's all about. Should I have a go? <laughs> um, oh, like that, this, this sort of question fills my brain and I don't try to try and talk too long. Um, but I think... Me personally, I think for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country and for young people in this country, uh, we're still sort of surviving the terra nullius doctrine that was this country was settled on, which pretty much positioned us as, as primitive peoples. Um, so we're pretty much positioned that way. Uh, so either, you know, inadvertently or directly, we get confronted with this idea that we're not worthy or not respected, yeah? Um, the narrative is changing, I think, um, within that. But I suppose what I'm saying here is for any Aboriginal youth, we really got to see that we're a part of this thing called science, this thing called mathematics, this thing called, you know, this technology, and where we interface with that as well. Um, we need to bring forward all the stories where we were great innovators, you know. Um, we, we need to be positioned as a, as a sophisticated people that was here before you know, British colonisation. You know, we, we were actively managed a whole country in a sustainable way. And we set up systems to do that. It wasn't just because we walked around and threw a few spears, is we actively managed this whole country and set up a societal system that was sustainable. And that is something that is really worth understanding and knowing. And, and our Aboriginal youth has lived through that colonisation period where a lot of that knowledge has been pushed aside. So even as Aboriginal people, we got to start to get to know that systems again as well. Um, and then from those sort of bases, I think we can see the connections between what we call science and mathematics now. Yeah. 
see how our systems are mathematical and see what the science is that we used to practice. Um, and I think when we make those proper connections and allow them to sit within the education system, I think then that we're going to see um, children aspire to those sorts of things. Because at the moment, we're still aspiring to, foot, to footy players. And there's, there's nothing wrong with sport, don't get me wrong, but you just don't want to have an unbalanced thing where there's only one way you can look. You want to have children be able to look at many ways and see how you're connected. I suppose what I want to say to any Aboriginal youth is, who is listening today is that there's Aboriginal people across the whole spectrum of STEM. You know, you do belong in this space. And if you do have a passion and an interest in it, then go for it. Thanks, Chris. I'll just give a few quick points there too. Um, building on what Lisa and uh, Chris have said, uh, just a few key points about role models and taking advice you're asking about, Herve. I mean, I think that um, there, these are really, really important things to young people, to students when they're thinking about um, going into science or whether they want to be a science or what inspires them. So I think one point is that students need access to role models um, who are teaching them as their teachers, not just that science and math is uh, learning and memorizing things or, you know, remembering an equation or, um, you know, uh, uh, learning what's in the textbooks, which is often how science and math is taught, but actually just a teacher who lets kids know what science really is, which is basically just asking a question, scratching on a question just a little bit differently than anybody might have done before, right? Just pushing, pushing your, uh, a little bit of knowledge, looking at something a little bit differently, trying to solve a problem. That's what science really is. It's not about these other ways that we often introduce kids to it. And I'd say that, you know, um, as Lisa's point, you know, we need to make sure that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a young person that you know there's a lot of ways to be a scientist, but it's not just being a teacher or a professor, it's also a whole different uh, variety of ways you can be a scientist. So role models from all kinds of parts of, of society that have a science background. Then it's really important that kids uh, be able to see like Chris is talking about, uh, role models that have their own background. And that's not always been the case. It's been a huge problem in science. So, you know, people need to see indigenous role models and, you know, uh, all kinds of different backgrounds uh, there. And then finally, uh, Chris's point I love that, you know, we should uh, celebrate as a society role models in science more than we do, you know, so that uh, it's not just sports figures or, you know, um, um, uh, music stars or something that kids really, really get a chance to be exposed to, but it's, you know, people that are pursuing these other kinds of impacts on society too. Those are my thoughts. Thanks so much, Christopher. I'm, I'm just looking at the time. I'm just realizing that we're getting close to the mark. So I'm really worried because we're only starting to get uh, into the topics. Um, so uh, just, just before I, I ask one last question and we, we start wrapping up, I, I do want to say that um, there are amazing videos by the three panelists that you have. Uh, if you look them, them up on YouTube, if you want to learn more about their work or their vision about science and um, and the particular topics that they, they talked about. And that conversation can continue, of course. So do feel free to reach out to us. Do feel free to um, ask scientists to come in classrooms, share their knowledge, share what it is to be a scientist. It doesn't have to be a famous scientist. Every, every scientist, in fact, is famous because they are contributing to science. And that's really important. Um, I just finished with one question that came from the audience. Um, and I think, I think we have touched a little bit upon this, but maybe we'll just have a final word on this. How do you think our understanding of science would be different if the right people had been credited? So what would the world look like if justice had been made earlier? That's a tough one. Um, does anyone want to volunteer some thought? Well, I think um, if the right people have been credited for science, um, the world wouldn't be in a catastrophic climate emergency. Um, if, for example, Indigenous knowledge was respected, we wouldn't be in this mess. So um, that's uh, something we can aspire to, to learning from each other, to actually fix um, the problems that we've caused for ourselves 
and to do so urgently. And that's a, a real positive vision for the future that young people can be part of. Yeah, look, I, I agree with Lisa's statement. Um, I cheekily say that, you know, um, under European management, we've had dead fish going down the river. We've had the coral reef that's now dying or bleaching, whatever you like to say, um, and many, many other things. So I think there are uh, there is a, a, a real space here for open trust on the people, even the bushfires, you know, um, there, there's, there's a need to, to work with Aboriginal people on all these sort of issues. Um, also cheekily used to say that, um, you know, if, if uh, the British settled on, the, on a different idea and worked with Aboriginal people from the very beginning 200 years ago, um, we already had the aerofoil. So maybe we, we wouldn't be talking about the Wright brothers, maybe we'd be talking about other, a team of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people who actually invented flight, you know. Maybe we're the ones who went to the moon, who knows? <laughs> but there's a lot, a lot of different things. And I suppose too, you know, we can't forget about the economic benefits that people didn't receive. And, and if they actually received the, the recognition and benefits that they were, that should have been afforded to them, then their community, their people, um, and the flow on effects from that, would, would, you know, you, you, you can't imagine what could have, could have possibly happened. I think, um, I think we'd be in a more respectful position as Australia. Um, we wouldn't have a lot of the um, social justice issues that we have and probably a lot of the educational issues maybe. Um, and, and I think now, though, is the time to start building on a respectful relationship and hopefully we can get there. I'll just close with my thought. I think that Chris and Lisa have, have, have nailed it. Um, think of all the missed opportunities over centuries that, um, that we've absolutely missed the boat on because of this way of operating. So. Um, yes, I agree with Lisa and Chris that we'd be so much farther along the path to solutions to the really, really big problems that are the problems of our day right now. So really, really important to think about and to course correct. Thank you so much uh, for these very thoughtful answers. I think we will uh, wrap now. It's, it's quite frustrating because there's, there's so much more I wanted to, to talk about. Um, but I think it was a good exploration of a really important topic. And so if I were to conclude with just one, one thought, I just want to make it clear for everyone that uh, science is for everyone. Uh, if you are in the audience and you think you're interested by science, don't let anyone else tell you that's not for you, no matter uh, your background or how you identify. But even more importantly, uh, as I hope was clear through the examples shown by the people today, science needs everyone. Actually, there's a lot of scientific evidence now that diversity is extremely important. We don't need um, the perception of only one kind of scientist. We need the perception of millions of different people with different ways of thinking. And that is what makes science really progress. And so um, science needs everyone needs um, female people, male people, people of different gender identities. Um, we need queer people. We need people of color. We need people of different social backgrounds. We need, we definitely need Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And we need everyone in science. We need old and young people. Uh, all of you are needed um, to make science progress. So I just, this is really important. And uh, remember uh, without diversity, science will not progress. Um, so just to, uh, to finish, I just really wanna thank you all for being here uh, and uh, making these really thoughtful contributions. And I wanna thank the people in the background who are not in the spotlight today, but in particular, Holly Kershaw and Tess Johns who have come up with the ideas for this panel and uh, even the ideas of inviting us to uh, participate. And so once again, there's an example of, uh, there's a lot of people in the background doing amazing work and without them, um, things like uh, today's panel wouldn't be here. So thank you so much. And thank you for the Australian Museum and uh, the Botanic Gardens for supporting this event. Thank you all. Are we still being recorded? <laughs>